everybody. Welcome to the Michael Cutler Hour. I am your host, Michael Cutler. It is second in 2008, and a Easter is blowing through the East. My goodness, what a trip home today. So um, I'm starting an hour late, a uh, bit better late than ever, but the show must go on. And so here is the show, and I thank you for joining me. Hope you've all had a good week. And it's always great to be able to play that game of catch up with you at the end of the week to try to sort out the madness uh, that seems to pass for the norm in this very wacky era. I am absolutely convinced that Rod Serling, the uh, creator of the Twilight Zone, maybe is creating some of our headlines. And um, maybe some of our politicians could be characters in one of old Rod Serling uh, episodes at the Twilight Zone because the world has gone mad. Not uh, a shocker to you, I'm sure. If you're familiar with me, you know that I'm a retired senior special agent with what used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS. Today, uh, that agency, having been disbanded, dismantled, um, and, and, and screwed over royally by both the Bush and Obama administrations, reconstituted supposedly under ICE, under the Department of Homeland Security, uh, still have big issues with what is going on over there. Certainly, anything or almost anything would be an improvement over what we experienced under the Obama administration and, frankly, under the Bush administration. Um, so we're going to get to it, but I just want to remind you about some websites that I'd like you to go check out, please. And by the way, if you find my program to be interesting, worthwhile, if you find them providing you with information and perspectives uh, that you're not getting from the mainstream media, then I'm succeeding. Because that's what my goal has been ever since 9-11. But please, I ask that you be part of what I call my bucket brigade of truth and let as many of your friends and neighbors and colleagues at work and cohorts, wherever, know about my program, know about the articles that I write. Uh, this is a nonprofit making situation. I've been doing it ever since the ashes from the conflagration at Ground Zero landed on my home. Uh, my rage translated into action. And the action that I've taken is to do everything I possibly can to try to be a mythbuster, to lay waste to the lies and the nonsense, the um, propaganda. And by the way, this isn't about political correctness. This is straight out of the pages of George Orwell and the Ministry of Truth. This is newspeak, not political correctness. And by the way, one other point that I'm going to make, and I'll probably repeat it a little bit later on because I feel so, so strongly about this. When I write articles for various magazines and websites, I see some of the postings. People get nasty about, you know, who the Democrats are or who the Republicans are, folks. It's not the American people that are the problem. Uh, well, we, maybe we are because we've been negligent and not involved. And that is a problem, very big problem. <clears throat> but when I hear the nasty stuff, well, oh, those Democrats, the Democrats, whatever they want to call them, and the, and the, Demo the, the, the liberals talk about the conservatives similarly, let's get past that. This is the kind of dissension that the Russians must love. This is also the dissension that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as well as the American Civil Liberties Union and Mecha and LULAC and all these other groups, both sides, they're thrilled that we're fighting among ourselves and ignoring what they're doing because they are really on the same page. They really are. And when I hear people say, well, this guy is a good candidate, he's a conservative, oh my gosh, you're not learning what the lessons really are. This isn't the left-right issue. But I will tell you that the left and right are slamming America and Americans. They want cheap labor. They want campaign contributions from the people who bribe them, because let's be real blunt, campaign contributions are bribes, period. Don't tell me that they're not bribes. Don't tell me about the First Amendment. They're bribes. I wasn't allowed to accept a cup of coffee when I was on duty as a federal agent. And if the concern was that a cup of coffee could alter my way of doing business, that I would be less than fair and objective then what in the world do you think happens when hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in campaign funds are involved? So let's not be naive and let's not be foolish. And let's also understand um, that there are many people, both sides of the aisle, as Americans. I'm not talking about the politicians. They're a whole other story by themselves. But there are many Americans who have been duped, who really are compassionate, decent human beings. And they've been drinking the Kool-Aid and haven't realized the way that they've been manipulated, the way they've been stabbed in the back by the, both political parties. Let's remember that. And we need all Americans on the same page. 
And if you go out there insulting people, don't expect that they're going to listen to anything you have to say afterwards. Who would? You wouldn't. I wouldn't. Let's knock it off. Let's make it our mission to have civil conversations with our fellow Americans, particularly if they disagree with us or with you. That's what debate is about. That's why you have safe spaces on college campuses today, to shut down debate, to not let Americans sit down and speak to one another, because you know what would happen if Americans actually sat down and had an honest conversation? We would find out that we are far more in agreement than disagreement. And that would pose a threat to the political elite, to the one percenters, to the oligarchy. Indeed, America is run by an oligarchy, make no mistake. So please think about it. Before you're quick to start to hurl epithets at the people on the other side of the political spectrum, slow down, take a deep breath. Those people are our allies. If only we can succeed and get them to understand the truth. Because both parties have done this to us, are continuing to do it to us, pass or want to pass legislation that's supposed to solve the problem. And sometimes I hear lunacy. Well, yes, it's not perfect legislation, but it's better than anything we've seen this year. Folks, that's not why you, why you get behind legislation, because it's not as bad as some other garbage that's been put out there. And let's think about something else. Because people are always trying to understand why one party versus the other party are doing these things. Politicians don't always stay in office. And very often when they're about to leave office, they want to feather their nests. And I can tell you, and this may be a shock, but many politicians, Democrat and Republican alike, are immigration lawyers or have friends who are immigration lawyers or get campaign contributions from immigration lawyers. And so if you are trying to pander to the immigration lawyers, there's a couple of things that you must do. First of all, never, ever, under any circumstances, allow illegal aliens to be arrested and deported from the United States. Let them be arrested because then that drums up business for the lawyers. But don't you dare let them be deported because if they're deported, the lawyers are losing their clients. That's the reason why there are so few immigration agents enforcing the immigration laws from within the interior of the United States. New York City has about 37,000, 38,000 police officers. We have 6,000 ICE agents for the entire United States of America, and half of them aren't even doing immigration work. Why is that? Why do we keep hearing about hiring more Border Patrol agents, but never hear anything about hiring more immigration agents? There's some legislation that's out there right now that wouldn't hire a single additional ICE agent, but State Department agents, so that they'll go after visa fraud. Why not hire immigration agents? Because immigration agents are going to lock up illegal aliens and seek their deportation. That runs contrary to the American Immigration Lawyers Association that quite bluntly sees in that tsunami of humanity that entered our country illegally or went on to violate their immigration status in the country, those are their clients. Don't you for a heartbeat think that they want their clients removed from the United States. That is their source of income. You've heard of ambulance chases? Well, those immigration lawyers, for the most part, are coyote chases, smuggler chases. They love that these aliens are here. It's money. And that was the reason why comprehensive immigration reform would have paid the legal fees. For the illegal aliens, we don't pay fees for the legal immigrants who can abide by the law. The government certainly doesn't pay for your accountant to do your tax returns. Why in the world do you think immigration lawyers um, would be happy that, or, or the Congress rather, would be happy to pay legal fees for illegal aliens? Because the immigration lawyers want to be paid. Illegal aliens don't have two nickels to rub together. But Uncle Sam, Uncle Sap sure has the money. This isn't about pandering to illegal aliens. People have said that to me. Oh, they're pandering to the illegals. Folks, it makes no sense to pander to the illegals. You don't pander to the powerless. That's an exercise in futility. The idea of providing free lawyers for the illegal aliens was about pandering to the attorneys who want to be paid, and they know that Uncle Sam won't stiff them. The illegal alien who has no money, lots of luck trying to collect. This is always about the lawyers. It's always about the ulterior motive. It's about flooding America with cheap labor. And for those of you who think, by the way, that this is only on the left, it's on the right. 
understand, uh, wait till you hear what the Koch brothers are up to. But we'll, we'll get to them momentarily. But, but first of all, let me just tell you the websites where I want you to go. Please go to my own personal website. It's michaelcutler.net, C-U-T-L-E-R, michaelcutler.net. Please go to frontpage.com. That's front page magazine. Sponsored by David Barnes Freedom Center. I've been a columnist them for a number of years, very proud to work with a great organization. I write for the social contract. I've been involved with those folks for over a decade. Newsmax has been publishing my articles. Uh, I hope to get some more stuff back up on progressives for immigration reform. We're taking a hard look at how I could perhaps help them. And yes, progressives for immigration reform. Folks, this is not a left-right issue. That is the huge mistake everyone makes. You know, and think about how the media portrays it. Oh, the extreme right-wing conservatives. They want the border secured. Folks, listen. I don't know of any American who is rational, who is rational, who's happy about the threat of terrorism or gangs or drugs or violence. I don't know any American who has a job who is looking forward to losing his job to a foreign worker, whether it's the guy that does the less trained, less skilled work, or even the high-tech workers. Because both sides of that economic equation are getting slammed the goal, folks, is to bring in workers specifically from the third world. And do you know what makes third world workers so special, so valuable? Because they bring with them third world expectations of wages and working conditions. And when you have enough employees, that expectation becomes the norm. That is how you turn America into a third world country. So please think about it. Think about what's involved. Think about what's at stake. Please don't fall into this trap of pointing an accusatory finger at your neighbor who leans left or right. Ignore that. Look at the politicians from both parties who are in agreement. Don't you for a heartbeat think that there's much difference between the Democrats and Republicans on the immigration issue. Certain candidates, certain members of Congress are concerned but both parties, they have the exact same goals. Understand that. Not left-right, it's right-wrong. And we should be the best salespeople we can be to convince our neighbors who disagree with us that they have been swindled. They have been conned. It's a con job. And when you hear politicians saying that the immigration system is broken, Run for your life. That is the biggest lie you're ever going to hear about the immigration debate. Raise your hands. You know who you are. If you think the immigration system is broken, go back to school. Learn how to think. Learn how to think. The immigration system is the most efficient operation in the entire federal government. Every single department. There isn't a department that's running better than the immigration component agencies, depending on what it is you expect the agencies that are involved with immigration to do. You and I, as American citizens, want the laws enforced, want the flood of illegal aliens to stop. We're not always <laughs> getting that because the folks at the top of the economic food chain want the exact opposite. This is failure by design. This is about flooding America with cheap, compliant, exploitable labor. And the illegal alien who comes here to be exploited is not the enemy. They're as much a victim as we are. Think about that. They live in countries that are disasters. President Trump got it right when he said what he said. He wasn't describing the people. He was describing the countries that they're fleeing from. And he's exactly right. So when you heard people screaming, oh, my God, what Trump said about the people. No, that wasn't what he was saying. But this is the game that's being played. And most people don't think they say, oh. Trump said that about those people. What a racist he is. If you look at the poverty and the disease and educational situation in many of those third world countries, they're terrible places. That's why people are running for their lives, literally. And that's all that the president said. But the mainstream media and the politicians, and this is more on the left on this issue, oh, what the president said was so awful. Countries are sewer sludge, whatever you want to call it. So please don't misunderstand what's being said and what's going on. 
The goal is to flood America with cheap, compliant, exploitable labor. Exploitation is not compassion, not any rational person's world. Okay? The real villains are the people who want to maintain the status quo. America is a safety valve for the third world. Now, Mexico is kind of interesting. It's a third world country, but it has one of the most vibrant economies on the planet. At one point, I don't know where the ranking is now, but they were 16th or 17th largest economy in the, in, on the world, in the world. So why is it that you have either extreme wealth or extreme grinding poverty? Because there is no middle class. That's what happens. Guess what's happening to the American middle class? Look at the purchasing power of the average American family. It has been eroded. The guy that says, oh, I'll go out and buy a couple of cars for my kids, not so much. But in, interestingly, we've never had more billionaires living in the United States than today. Billionaires with a B. Because we are devouring the middle class by design. Alan Greenspan talked about it. I've written about it. When Greenspan testified to Chuck Schumer back on April 30th, 2009, there was a hearing about comprehensive reform. Can we do it and how? I said it reminded me of an apocryphal law firm, Dewey Cheatham and how. Okay? Greenspan referred to American high-tech workers as the privileged elite earning a wage premium because they were being shielded from foreign competition. His solution, he said, to wage inequality wasn't to raise the wages of the people at the bottom so much as to force middle class wages down to narrow the gap between America's poor and what used to be America's middle class. And he hasn't mended his ways. He's written more articles since then calling American highly skilled workers the privileged elite. The guy that has a mansion in the Hamptons talks about the middle class as the privileged elite. Uh, goodness gracious, where in the world does he come off? And I remembered when I first heard him, uh, when I first saw that hearing, it was streamed live, and I think the hearing may be available still on the Senate website, maybe not, I'm not sure. But you can read the transcript, you can read his prepared de testimony, it'll blow your mind. I was on a radio show the next day, this young lady whose show I was on said to me, what were your thoughts of Greenspan as you watched him testify? And I said, well, as I watched him, I knew I was witnessing the first. And she said, you know, Mike, I, I've had you on my show for far too long to know that this is probably not a good idea. But what kind of a first was it? And I was so angry. I said, well, it's probably the first time that someone testified before a congressional hearing while suffering from rigor mortis. I have an extreme dislike for Mr. Greenspan, for his hypocrisy, for his hatred of American workers and their families. I have a problem with Greenspan. We should all have a problem with people like Greenspan. When you could refer to middle-class American workers as the privileged elite, something is terribly wrong. And what's so remarkable is that when I approached Republicans and said, hey, why don't you use this as a campaign issue? They changed the subject. And I'm talking about chairman of, of committees and subcommittees. They didn't want to have that conversation. Do you know why? Because they are on the same page with Alan Greenspan. And Alan Greenspan was invited by Chuck Schumer. So please understand that both parties have the same agenda. It is the destruction of America's middle class. It is about uh, importing a, a new voter, a voter that has lower expectations of what government is supposed to do for them, about democracy, about freedom. People that run for office, I truly believe, are control freaks. They run for office because it, it's kind of psychotic. On the one hand, they want... They want the power, but on the other hand, they got to suck up to the voter until they get elected, and then they don't want to talk to the common folk anymore until there's another election. This is truly a, 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 a situation of mental illness for many of these characters. Uh, I've been approached about running for Congress. My answer is I run from Congress. Thank you. Understand, when you look through the prism that I look through, everything suddenly makes sense. How in the world do we only have a couple thousand immigration agents? if we're really concerned about enforcing our immigration laws. Laws get enforced, and, and, and that's what you do when, when laws aren't being followed. Out on, the, I think it was Suffolk or Nassau County here in New York, they were, you know, jumping up and down with glee and saying, look at that, um, fatality rates on the, our, our roads are much lower. And then, you know, why did they say the mortality rates driving on Long Island here in New York is lower? Because of effective law enforcement. You see, when people were driving drunk, they tightened up on uh, the acceptable blood alcohol level. They established sobriety checkpoints and they, they increased 
uh, the penalties for driving drunk. More money, jail time, seizing vehicles, you name it. They drop a safe on your head if you're caught driving drunk. They didn't say there's too many people drinking and driving to do anything about it. Where illegal aliens are concerned, that's what we hear. Oh, there's so many of them. God knows. All we can do is give them lawful status. It's crazy. It's a non-solution that would exacerbate things. But of course, it was supposed to exacerbate things. What did I just tell you? The immigration system is the most efficient delivery system, this side of FedEx and UPS. It delivers what the elite want. Unlimited, cheap, exploitable labor, and not just the bottom rung. It includes high-tech workers as well. Think about that. Foreign tourists, they come, they spend their money. They want them to sleep in those expensive hotels. And, of course, they want illegal aliens to change the sheets in the hotels so that the lower, their overhead is reduced while their profits go up. That's all that they want. And foreign students. So everyone's talking about China and about how their technology poses a threat. And Russia is now boasting about some new weapon systems they have. But where are they getting all the technology from? From us. How do they do it? Well, espionage, but they also have students studying in our schools. China has 150,000 students studying the STEM curriculum right now. Science, technology, engineering, math. They get to work and do optional practical training. And there are financial incentives to take more and more of these foreign students and have them displace American students. Margin is just too great. And these people don't love America. They love money. For them, the bottom line is the bottom line is the bottom line. So if you don't care about America and you're too stupid to understand long-term consequences, this is, I guess, what you do. I compare these people to a cancer cell. See, cancer has an insatiable appetite for nutrients. And when a cancer invades its victim's body, it starts to secrete hormones that cause the body to envelop that tumor with blood vessels so it can bathe, it can swim, it can do the backstroke in nutrients. And that works out real well for a while, but eventually the tumor absorbs all the nutrients and starves off the healthy tissue, and then it starts to spread out, and eventually it kills the victim. Now, the ironic thing is when it kills its victim, the cancer dies with the victim. The cancer is mindless. It's just driven by chemistry. The super wealthy that have more money than anyone could imagine, their interest that comes in every day from their billions, they can't spend fast enough, okay? But they're playing Monopoly for real. This is a game, and they're going to play it with real money and real lives, and they don't care because they just need to win. And when they need to win, they don't think long-term consequences that if you destroy America, waiting in the wings or China, Russia, Iran, terrorists, and so forth, chaos. They can't see beyond that. They're playing that Monopoly game for real, and all they can think about is, Who's going to be number three in the Forbes list? Who's going to be number 10? I want to beat Charlie because Charlie's, you know, whatever number, and I want to have more than that. They're playing games with our lives, with our freedom, with, the children, with our children's future, and with the future of our grandchildren. This is really sociopathic. It truly is. Most people, most people, normal, decent, honorable people, simply want a decent job, work that they find fulfilling, so that they can support themselves and their families, buy a house, perhaps a car, put a decent meal on the table, and go on vacation for two weeks every year. And then they say, well, I've got my thin slice of the American dream. The people that I'm describing to you, they have a very different view of the universe. They have outsized egos, very low morality, if any, and they don't give a damn about the havoc that they create in people's lives because for them, winning isn't number one. It's all that there is is winning. And we and America are losing as a consequence. Consider what you're witnessing is by design, by intent. Flooding America with cheap labor, the immigration system is dysfunctional. It's because our politicians are dysfunctional and they've been bought and paid for and it's called political campaign contributions. That's how we got ourselves into this mess. Even after the 9-11 Commission warned us that immigration law enforcement was at the root of the fact that our country was attacked. Interior enforcement was a critical issue. And you're going to be hearing all kinds of stories, by the way. Oh, my God, ICE went out there and they did these raids in California. And you know what happened? Some of those aliens weren't even criminal. They were not people. And those mean ICE agents came and arrested them. Let me tell you I worked with Senator DeMarco in the early 80s so that we 
create what became the Act of Entry to make unlawful reactions criminal means of maximum felony. Back then, there was no distinction between the criminal histories and criminal histories and alien who was illegally facing no two years in jail. So as a consequence, attorneys didn't want to prosecute illegal aliens for re-entry. So what's the point, Mike? We get the guy in a trial, or actually there's not much in a trial, that's the beauty of re-entry. Your defense is not here. You know, I put together a re-entry case in the case of the about being cost effective. Conspiracy investigation requires 2008 surveillance and it's on feature. Entry can be put into the belief about in the new. Their print goes on the one deportation. Their name is on there. He that he with that document. Put him on the plane and he goes. If he comes back, all he was a check that shows he would give it all for them to get such authorization. Very, very. I can't think of the same case when he was given authorization he was deported to return to the United States. But I still get, I still get a document that shows I never authorization return, and you write the print. You can put your finger on the one that's attached to his hand and say, whoops, the guy is deported. He's back to the grand jury. The grand jury is up in the night. He's closed. Now, what would you say? I'm not really here. So it's a slam dunk prosecution. It takes a couple of hours. But the problem was, not that it was the biggest to get time served. So I approached him and said, you know, Senator, this changed. Two years in jail for a guy that's washing in the back of the store. That's fine. The full hand. That's cool. Who's the senior? She's legal. Who cares? This guy is a child, a racist, terrorist, drug, a bank, a rent, a He is. We need to really make it clear that we deport you come back and drop a safe on you. This is a good way of deterring from returning. It's a good way for watching those who return. And they're going to say, gee whiz, an afternoon's worth of work. We could put away from the bad guy. Excellent. We did. We got the law passed. And believe it or not, this crime that we've never prosecuted is now the free felony in the United States. It's below 50% of all federal prosecutions across the United States. When you look at the numbers, over 50% of the process attorney's office across America for reentry after deportation. You can make changes. You can make things really work if you want to make things work. So what we're hearing is, well, the guy wasn't really a criminal. Well, there's another issue. Terrorists tend to not get arrested for crimes. Some of them do, but they try not to. Somebody once said that a good spy is somebody who would not attract the attention of a waiter or waitress in a greasy spoon diner. In in point of fact, it might well be that waiter or waitress in that diner is a spy. I've encountered people working in diners who were involved with terrorism. That's a story for another day. You know, what does a bad guy look like? So when I approached Amato, I said, look, we need to change the penalty for reentry. We did. Then I said, we should be holding deportation hearings in the prisons. Why do we let somebody languish in jail for 15 years for committing rape, arson, homicide, whatever? Then they get out. We're going to try to deport them. If we don't have jail space, the person gets released. They become a fugitive, an absconder. Maybe they rape some more women. Maybe they do some more damage. If you can get someone ordered deported while they're in jail, get it all finalized. When that person is to be released, you put them on an airplane and you wave goodbye. That became the institutional hearing program. The final thing I said to Senator D'Amato is one of the other things that we should look at is prioritizing criminal aliens over non-criminal, but only prioritizing, not only looking to arrest people with criminal histories. And here's the reason why. Number one, terrorists. And back then we weren't really that concerned about terrorists. This is the early 80s, long before we had uh, you know, a succession of attacks here in the United States. But I, I said, first of all, you want to make certain that the issue of randomness comes into play. You have fugitives from justice. You have criminals. You have all kinds of people from all over the world that come to America fleeing the long arm of the law. They may not be known to us. So even if you just find an illegal alien, arrest them, document them. By the way, a bail decision can be made where they don't have to post bail or it can be a very low bail if they're not a risk to the community. There's a lot of discretion that goes on. 
but most importantly, let's document that we've got that person. Fingerprint, photograph, do the paperwork, because now you've got something to hold on to. You have an idea about who's here. Now, it's my understanding that at least a couple of the 9-11 hijackers, if I remember correctly, were stopped for speeding just days before 9-11. I believe Mohammed Atta, the ringleader, was actually stopped for speeding. No criminal history. But just think, you're out of status, you're stopped by the police. Imagine if Mohammed Atta had been referred to immigration agents and they held him as an illegal alien. Without realizing the insignificance of what happened, you might have unwound the 9-11 attack when he was stopped for speeding. That's the whole point of randomness. Many of the people wanted by the FBI, the FBI's 10 most wanted, many of them get arrested, not by the FBI, but by local cops when they stop somebody for speeding. I was involved with a case involving a couple of Trinidadians who were bank robbers and had killed a bunch of people. And what do they get stopped for? Running a red light. So randomness is a very important tool in law enforcement. So you want to go after the known threats first and foremost. You have limited resources. It's kind of a triage. Go after the known threats. You've got a guy who's a criminal. You've got a guy who shows up on a terror watch list. Certainly that guy's your priority. But as you go knocking on doors looking for the bad guy, if you find somebody else who is here illegally, you need to bring that person in. And by the way, it also makes it clear to the whole world that we do take our borders and our immigration laws seriously. If it doesn't matter that you're here illegally unless you have a criminal history, then why do we bother with the Border Patrol? Why do we bother inspecting passengers at ports of entry? Why are we spending $14 billion a year on Customs and Border Protection and employing over 60,000 federal employees if it doesn't matter how you come here? I mean, what we're really talking about is anarchy. And so if you want to talk about anarchy, look at what just happened in Oakland, California. In Oakland, California, you have a mayor by the name of Libby Schaff who went around and told the quote-unquote immigrant community, look out, ICE is coming for you. Two possibilities here, fight or flight. Most illegals are going to run, most. But some of these people are sociopaths. I've, I've arrested quite a few characters in my day. Uh, I was out on the streets for 26 years as an agent, and then four years before that I was an inspector at the airport. I was with the INS 30 years. There's a lot of crazy people, and there's a lot of these guys who have nothing to lose who would just as soon say, you know what? If they show up, let's shoot them. Thank God nobody got shot. But, you know, one thing that they teach in law enforcement, whether you're a federal agent, whether you're a local cop, when you go to execute a warrant in someone's house, all you have going for you is that you may have more people with you. You may be more heavily armed. But the biggest issue, element of surprise. Element of surprise. They don't know we're coming. It's 6 in the morning. Bango, you're there. And before they can get their eyes open, you're on top of them, handcuffing them. Been there and done that many, many, many mornings. Very rewarding. You have a bad guy in custody, it makes your day. But you're going to have some people that are going to say, I'm going to fight. I'm going to have my friend sleep with me. I'm going to get my, my 12-gauge shotgun and sleep with it. And you could wind up getting people killed. And somehow, Libby Schaff thought she was being heroic. It shows you how twisted this woman is. And she is a mayor, and she's not alone in this. You know, you get one opportunity for a first impression. And what Libby Schaaf wants the world to know is that in America, we value law violators more than we value our own citizens. But she's not alone. Nancy Pelosi said that dreamers were the best of the best of the best of the best. Now, what made them so great? They were smuggled aliens. In Nancy Pelosi world, if you really want to be valued, get yourself smuggled into the United States. Don't come legally. That's dull and boring. Don't follow the law. People will think you're a goody two-shoes. Violate our laws. Steal people's identities. Commit all kinds of terrible crimes. But we'll protect you from those mean ICE agents. Well, the acting director of ICE, Homan, said that assaults are up by more than 100% on ICE agents because of the hostility and the rhetoric of the open borders immigration anarchists who have convinced enough people that the ICE agents who are there trying to protect them are really the villains. This is how sick and twisted things have become, which is why I made the point about the Twilight Zone. So you've got Libby Schaff. She said she's willing to go to jail, and I hope she does. This woman needs to be charged with obstruction. She needs to be charged with harboring, shielding. Look, this is not what you're supposed to do. And she took an oath, which apparently means bupkis to her. 
and she apparently didn't care about the safety of the people in those communities where the ICE agents are operating, and the people most at risk from criminal aliens are the members of the ethnic immigrant communities, and not just within the Latino community, the Russian, the Asian, the African, the Caribbean, the European, the Middle East, doesn't matter. Human nature is human nature. Immigration laws are not about Latinos. Anyone who tells you that is a liar and a racist. I can tell you I spent years as an immigration agent where I didn't even speak to a single Spanish-speaking alien. The only distinction we made was between alien and citizen, and that is the distinction that the immigration anarchists want to eradicate. It's Orwellian. It's not about being politically correct. And look at the risk that we run. So we now come to my latest article for Front Page Magazine. Please go to frontpagemag.com. My article was published on February 28th. The title, Yet Another Naturalized Citizen Sentenced on Terrorism Charges, and the subtitle, Fatally Flawed Vetting Process Provided Somali-Born Terrorists with Citizenship and a U.S. Passport. And in this particular case, this guy from Ohio, his name was Abdirahman Sheikh Mohammed, native of Somalia, came to the United States with his brother, and it was their plan to get U.S. citizenship so they could get U.S. passports to facilitate their travel. In fact, this particular guy got his citizenship and his passport just a couple of weeks before, before going to Syria. Well, under the law, when an alien seeks to become a United States citizen, we are supposed to, or they are supposed to, I say we, in my mind, I'm still an agent, supposed to carry out a good moral character investigation. It's right in the law. It's not enough that the person hasn't been convicted of crimes, but the idea is to speak to the neighbors. Does he beat his wife? Does he go to the prostitutes? Does he go to illegal gambling parlors? Does he beat up on his children? Does he go around, you know, pinching women in the restaurant? Whatever. Because if he's that kind of a despicable cretin, we're not going to give him citizenship. It's the highest honor a country can bestow upon an alien, the citizenship in that country. So it's in the law. And under the Clinton administration, they also gave us the motor voter law. What do they do? They said, oh, we're just going to let you vote if you register to get, to get a driver's license. And believe me, there is voter fraud out there. There is voter fraud. You do have people voting repeatedly, and some of them might be citizens. You have aliens who have voted. Um, there is not much integrity to the voting system. Don't let anybody kid you. But, so you, you have this problem where aliens are coming to the United States, they want to be citizens, and the Clinton administration thought that their job, in fact, Doris Meisner, then commissioner for the Clinton administration, thought her job was to naturalize as many citizens as possible. She was so determined to naturalize the world that she hired more adjudications officers. When I started with the INS in 1971, only attorneys who had worked for the government for many years were allowed to adjudicate applications for citizenship. It's the key to the kingdom. It's the key to the kingdom. And now they were willing to hire anybody. You know, maybe the guy was flipping hamburgers last week at McDonald's, and today he's a naturalization examiner. Lots of luck. Let's crank him out. And she said, you know what? We don't even have to worry about those good moral characters. We'll just run names and check them that way. And it turned out that thousands and thousands of people got citizenship before their fingerprints came back. Forget about going out in the field and doing a good moral character investigation. So during this project that she created called Citizenship USA, CUSA, Roughly 1.1 million aliens were rushed through the system faster than you know what goes through a goose. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Here's your certificate of citizenship. And by the way, when an alien naturalizes, they can take any name they want, and their U.S. passport only reflects their new name. So we're allowing these folks to put themselves in their own witness protection program. This is insanity. <clears throat> this is insanity. And so the FBI has electronic communication between these two brothers, um, where the, the one brother is already in Syria telling the brother who's here, the one that I wrote about, where is your citizenship? Why aren't you getting that passport? You need to get that passport so you can come here. But make sure you get that passport first. So U.S. citizenship was part and parcel of the terror plot. Why did none of this show up during the investigation before we gave him citizenship? It's not as though this guy became a naturalized citizen 15 years ago, and then he fell into the wrong crowd. This guy, from the moment he filed the application to become an American citizen, was doing so specifically to get a U.S. passport to facilitate his travel to Syria so that he could attend terror training camp, fight on the side of, I believe it was the al-Nusra Front, a terror organization linked to ISIS. And then his goal was to come back to the United States and kill as many Americans as possible. Think about that. 
And he's not the first one who became a naturalized citizen and then went on to take a, take a role within the terrorist uh, networks. Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, became a citizen. About a year later, sets off a car bomb in Times Square. Uh, look at the Tsarnaev brothers. One of them was a naturalized citizen, I believe, for less than a year, participates in the deadly attack in Boston. Time and time again, the Justice Department came up with a statistic, and the statistic goes back two years. So from around the time of 9-11 to two years ago, 148 naturalized citizens were subsequently arrested and prosecuted for terror-related crimes. What is that t- the vetting process. We hear all the concerns about the way we don't really see people by government. This time, some politicians jumping around and saying, what's the process for vetting aliens on law status that they agree with political asylum who has citizenship? No one says a word. Oh, we'll get a background check. We'll be safer. No, we're here to be safer. Because the background checks are not worth it, apparently. Not worth it. Anything worse than security, folks, is false security. This is security. Security. But again, understand both sides of the aisle are adamant to determine the dream of left workers, foreign students, and foreign students as possible. Every other Friday, for the occasion of creation, a terrific show by Dr. Walsh, WAEB. And I will tell you that Bob Walsh, tomorrow, I'm going to show my Neil Young of New Hampshire, WZ. I'm not sure what time the show is on three hours from nine until so I, well, Usually I go on until we're in the slot because time. But we, we, we are always talking about immigrants. Are those concerns? I'm not. I'm a registered Democrat. I list for Democrat. But on many issues, I would say Butler is liberal. No problem telling you that. I, I am. I'm American. And many of my friends are conservatives, and they're close friends, and we value our, our friendship. That's the beauty of America and democracy. So when I see people, you know, using derogatory language to describe other Americans, stupid, stupid, stupid. It doesn't get dumber than that. We should be standing together, shoulder to shoulder, and saying, okay, let's put Americans first, American workers, American kids. Let's make sure they get the education they need. Let's get the gangs off the street. Let's get the drugs off the street. Let's keep terrorists out of our country. Let's make certain that we do everything in our power so that, as good stewards, we leave this country better than we found it when we were born or when we came here, if we're naturalized. And please don't tell me I'm not pro-immigrant. My mom came here ahead of the Holocaust as a 14-year-old girl. My dad's parents came here legally. So, you know, oh, you're anti-immigrant. Well, all this language on both sides, it's got to stop. You see, if we really sat down and have that face-to-face, one-on-one conversation, Everybody would be shocked because they would suddenly say, gee whiz, there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. And, of course, everyone says, oh, they're conservatives, so they're great. I hear this all the time, and I laugh. I can't stop laughing. I I laugh in the face of foolishness. The Koch brothers, well, they're known for being conservatives, good conservatives. So I was on with Bobby, Bobby Gunther Walsh today. I'm usually on every other Friday with him. And he sent me this little tag about a group called the Libre Initiative, L-I-B-R-E, the Libre Initiative. And so I, I said, that's interesting. And this is a, it, it looks like a quasi-conservative group pushing for the dreamers to be legalized. This is what we have to do, legalize the dreamers. And of course, you know, I've spoken about this before, uh, and I have a real problem with it. These are people who may not be as young as they, you think they are because they only have to claim they came before they were 16, but today they could be as old as 36. I'm on the wrong side of 60. 36 sounds awfully young, but let me tell you what, (laughs) 36 is not a child. And so the president opened the potential up that everybody and anybody could claim to be a dreamer. And who's pushing for this whole program? The Koch brothers. These conservatives, they want the dreamers, but they also want something else. They want to eliminate the minimum wage. Now stop and think about those two things. My, My buddy Bobby Gunther, says, oh, no, we need no, we, we have to get rid of minimum wage. This should be about supply and demand. But he agrees with me only if we have secure borders so that we don't keep flooding America with cheap labor. Because two things happen when you flood America with third world workers. Number one, they bring with them third world expectations of wages and working conditions, so that becomes the new norm. Additionally, labor is a commodity. And when you dump a commodity into the market, 
you devalue that commodity. And in fact, if you look at what's going on with aluminum and steel, the Trump administration talking about uh, you know tariffs, because right now China and other countries are dumping aluminum and steel into the U.S. market, depriving Americans of their jobs. And we're losing our self-sufficiency to be able to produce what we need within our own country. That's a matter of national security. After Pearl Harbor, it didn't take long for General Motors to stop making cars and start making airplanes, tanks, and machine guns, you see? Because we had the production lines, we had the steel, we had the workers. All they had to do was just retool. That's why there's no 1942, 1943, 1944, 1945 cars. Because all the production lines had switched over to making tanks, airplanes, and guns. What would we do today if, God forbid, there was a war? What production lines? Go to China? I mean, where are we going to do this? So what the president wants to do, and I agree, we need to be self-sufficient. And one of the egregious issues is that China and other countries are dumping steel and aluminum on the market. They're dumping their workers on the market also. So the Koch brothers come along and they said, you know what? We're against minimum wage. Well, if you have third world workers with third world expectations of wages, and now you inflate the number of workers in the labor pool, both of those do what? Push down the value of labor below the floorboards. So a minimum wage is kind of like a safety net. You can fall, but you can only fall so far. These wonderful, wonderful, fabulous, terrific Koch brothers, what do they do? Well, let's flood America with third world workers. Oh, and let's eliminate, let's blow away minimum wage. So there is no safety net. This is kind of like the limbo. How low can you go? Those of you old enough to remember dancing under the limbo. How low can you go? So if you open up America to third world workers by the millions and you eliminate the safety net of minimum wage, you decimate, you decimate the wage structure for American workers. And the Koch brothers are conservative. Please understand this is not left-right. This is not left-right. This is about people on both sides of the political spectrum that are fixated on looting America, driving down wages, removing certain fringe benefits. How low can you go? Both sides of the aisle are hammering the American worker. Now, who started this? Well, I would say that this cascade of disaster started with the Democratic Party. The Republicans always represented the small businessmen and, and big business. And that's fine. This is America. You're entitled to, to represent them. But the Democrats used to balance the equation by looking out for the average American worker, whether it was a school teacher or a construction worker like my pop, who will always be my biggest hero, uh, whether it was uh, postal workers, whoever. The blue-collar jobs, the union jobs, the jobs that Americans took, those Americans were looked out for by the old Democrat Party, you know, the AFK Democrat Party. Once the Democrat Party turned back on the average American worker and gave them a representing the average American. The Republicans? No, they, they're still looking over at the, how do we help the businesses. I will tell you, Jeff Sessions, when you read what he has written about immigration, sounds more like a 50s Democrat than anything else. Jeff Sessions is one of my heroes. I can't tell you how proud I was that he quoted me on several occasions from the floor of the Senate when I called Comprehensive Immigration Reform the Terrorist Assistance and Facilitation Act. And you can see why. We are naturalizing terrorists. What do you do when you're dealing with millions of illegal aliens who snuck into the country? They entered surreptitiously. They trespassed. You give those people lawful status, how many more terrorists are you going to wind up with? Think of the article that I wrote a couple of weeks earlier about the Saudi who went to flight school in, in Oklahoma, and his fingerprints show up, and then the FBI woke up and said, oh, gee whiz, this guy's fingerprint showed up at a terror training camp in Afghanistan in 2000, and he apparently trained with at least four of the 9-11 hijackers. But meanwhile, he was lawfully admitted as a non-immigrant spouse of a student. His wife is here on a student visa. He came here in 2011, a decade after the attacks of 9-11. No one knew who the hell he was. But no one talks about how well we screen aliens trying to get into the United States or how we screen aliens once they're here and look for immigration benefits. We're our own worst enemy, folks. We're our own worst enemy. But please understand that the problem that we face is the members of Congress who don't care about their constituents. 
I compare them to the magician who promises to cut the lady in half. Now, we all know he's not really going to cut her in half for a couple of good reasons, starting with the fact that he doesn't want to go to jail. He also knows that if he cuts somebody in half, no one's ever going to work for him again. And who knows, maybe he was planning to take it to dinner that night, you know. But he's got to entertain the audience, and so he devises a very convincing trick, a magic act, that he's cut her in half. That's, that's magic. The politicians know that most Americans want secure borders and fair and effective immigration law enforcement. So they have to promise it. Just like the magician says, I'm going to cut the woman in half. They say, we're going to secure the borders. Sure. But they know if they really secure the borders, guess what happens, folks? The campaign contributions will stop. And they sure as hell need that money because they want to win the next election. So they have to create a convincing illusion that they're doing exactly what the constituents want, even as they laugh all the way to the bank where they deposit their campaign contributions. Now, you add to that how many members of Congress, how many politicians are immigration lawyers or have friends who are immigration lawyers whose campaigns are being funded by immigration lawyers. Follow the money. Follow the motivation. If you follow the motivation and you follow the money, you'll be able to figure out what's really going on. What's really going on is the great betrayal. The great betrayal of the average American worker and the average American family, and this isn't by one party or the other, it's by both parties ganging up on Americans. That's where your attention needs to be. Don't be distracted by that girl bouncing around on the stage and the blue smoke in the mirrors. Ignore all the distractions. At the end of the day, political parties have the same goal. The same goal. Unlimited foreign exploitable workers, foreign students, foreign tourists, if they want those campaign contributions from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and a laundry list of organizations on both sides of the political spectrum. This isn't a conservative issue. And when people tell you vote for a particular candidate because he's a conservative, not so fast, Charlie. Make sure what that particular candidate really stands for. Make damn sure. Because the politicians from both parties, they're playing us for a bunch of fools. And unfortunately, all too frequently, uh, our fellow citizens have acted like fools. And that's why you really need not to fight with your neighbors, not to insult your neighbors, but sit down and have a cup of coffee with your neighbor. And maybe you're going to want to pass along some of my articles for them to read. Maybe suggest they listen to this podcast or some other podcast. Knowledge is power. I'm trying to empower you. Please be part of my bucket brigade of truth. Because at the end of the day, with knowledge, you can see through all the blue smoke and all the mirrors and all the magic acts, and we can truly make a difference. But the first step on the journey is to have the facts, to know the truth, and then have the guts, the chutzpah to act on it. Because, you know, I always like to make that point that democracy is not a spectator sport. I want to thank all of you for uh, joining me this evening. Sorry that we were late for an hour. But I uh, plan to be back here again next Friday at the right time. <laughs> Wind hopefully will have died down and subsided by then. Uh, but meanwhile, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. See you next week right here on the Michael Cutler Hour. Good night. Good night.